you'd like, you can get out your Bibles and be heading in the direction of the Psalms. That's where we're going to be spending some time tonight. One of the places we're going to be spending some time tonight. I'm excited to share uh, this lesson with you this evening. So if I were to ask you for a famous quote from John F. Kennedy, something would probably come to your mind, right? Maybe more than one something. What's a, a famous quote that comes to your mind when you think about John F. Kennedy? Uh, ready? I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Maybe another one came to your mind. That's the one that first jumps into my head. Just an iconic quote that has been used so powerfully in so many different ways. If I were to ask you for a famous quote by this person here, William Shakespeare, could you dust off the cobwebs of your high school English literature and give me a quote or two uh, from Shakespeare? Well, what's a famous quote from William Shakespeare? Could you channel your inner Hamlet? To be or not to be, that's the question. Maybe that's one that comes to your mind. Uh, maybe you're more like Romeo, but soft what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Rise for a sun and kill the envious moon. I had to memorize that one. <laughs> maybe you remember some of those other little quotes that we maybe don't even remember Shakespeare quotes. Like, All the world's a stage. That was Shakespeare. Uh, what's another one here? I got a couple more. There's one. There you go. Uh, to thine own self be true. Shakespeare said that. Uh, not all that glitters is gold. You know, I've gotten all the words just right on that, but that's Shakespeare too. What about this here? Star Wars. There we go. Today's date might have helped you with that, right? May the force be with you. May the fourth be with you. Uh, Luke, I am your father is another one that everybody knows from Star Wars. Millions of people have watched this movie. I probably quote several things from it. I could give you, we could just do dozens more of these if you wanted to. And we could, for each person that I showed you or each movie that I showed you, you could probably come up with some iconic, memorable quote that just immediately comes to your mind. I'm guessing you could probably do it for this, too. If I were to ask you for a famous quote from the Old Testament, I'm guessing you could probably come up with a few, couldn't you? Uh, with this, you might have actually a hard time narrowing it all down uh, because there's so much there. Uh, so many beautiful things that you could say for that quote from the Old Testament that just rings true in your mind or the one that just everybody is bound to know. I bet you could probably think of a half a dozen, maybe a full dozen or more just really powerful quotes from the Old Testament. And I could be wrong and you might surprise me. I don't know if you would think of this one, the one that's going to be our verse for tonight. So tonight we're getting back into the Psalms, as I mentioned before. And you may recall, you know, it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in the Psalms. We've had two really awesome nights to, to have these updates on missions that we've done on Wednesday nights. We're getting back in the Psalms now. And as we race toward the end of this series, which we're going to wrap up this month, we've been doing some Psalms now that have a little bit of a story attached to them. Psalms where if you know a little bit of the context, it really brings it to life. And maybe that's something going on in David's life when he writes the words. Or we've looked at a few where we know a little bit about the use of that psalm, like how it was sung, when it was sung. It brings it to life. Or maybe it's like our case tonight, where it's a psalm that is quoted in the New Testament. Boy, is that true for this one. Because the verse that we're going to be looking at tonight, according to the best of my study, is the verse, the number one verse most often quoted in the New Testament that comes from the Old Testament. And I don't even mean just like the most quoted verse from the Psalms. I mean like of the entire Old Testament, this verse is the one that you find quoted the most in the new. Would this be the one that you would have guessed? It's Psalm 110, verse 1. 
The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. It's really remarkable. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, a few of them multiple times, quote this verse. Acts quotes this verse. 1 Corinthians quotes this verse. Ephesians quotes this verse. Colossians quotes this verse. Hebrews, on several different occasions, quotes this verse. This verse is quoted by Jesus himself. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Why this one? What is this verse saying? Because when Jesus says these words, when he quotes this verse, the way he uses it is almost like a riddle, in a sense. Answer me this, you scribes, Jesus says. On that day in the temple in Jerusalem, when everybody is coming to him and trying to trap him in his words. You remember there were times in Jesus' ministry where people would come and they'd ask him questions because they're really trying to trip him up. Well, this was one of those days. We read about it in Mark chapter 12. That's where we're going to look in just a moment. Uh, it's also in Matthew chapter 22. Same story in Luke chapter 20. The Pharisees come first. They've got a question about taxes. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar, Jesus? Answer, answer the question. Then the Sadducees come along and they have this question about the afterlife, even though they don't really believe in the afterlife. And they ask this question about marriage in the afterlife. Answer me, Jesus. And then a, a teacher of the law comes and he asks, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus tells them the greatest commandments. And then at the end of after all of these questions, Jesus sort of turns the tables and asks them a question. And it's a question about this verse. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Messiah is the Son of God? David himself, by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls himself, or David himself calls him Lord. So how can he be his son? And in Matthew's account, it says nobody was able to give him an answer. From that day forward, nobody dared to ask him a question like that anymore. They were stumped by this verse that Jesus quotes to them. He quotes it to them, but it's like a riddle to them. But then not many days later in the book of Acts, really not that many days later, Peter is going to quote the very same verse, but when he quotes it, it is not at all a riddle. It's meant to reveal the truth about Jesus. He uses it at the very climax of the first ever gospel sermon. To reveal the answer. And maybe this is part of why this verse is quoted so often. The New Testament writers use it time and time again. And I wonder if it's because there is a, a bit of a mystery to it. A bit of a riddle. But it's a riddle that is revealed. It's a mystery that God is going to crack open and show the world in the few days between that day in the temple when Jesus was answering all those questions to the day when Peter at Pentecost proclaims Christ crucified and resurrected and exalted. In the span of those days, between those two moments, God reveals the mystery of Psalm 110, verse 1. So tonight I want to talk a little bit about that mystery and the way that it gets 
revealed. And, and maybe we can talk a little bit about why it is that these New Testament writers think this is so important. And why we also ought to think it's important too. So the first thing I guess to do is to talk about the psalm itself. So this is one of the many uh, that was written by David. It's something you learn in your, your Bible, maybe the subtitle of your psalm. If you have your Bible open there, you might see that this is a psalm of David. And David, as you know, was what? He, he was the, the king of Israel. He sits on the throne of Israel. And that's who's speaking these words. But this is where things get a little puzzling. So the first words that David says are, the Lord says. And of course, he's talking about God. So we have David writing about God. But who's this other figure? The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Who else would fit that description? Now, of course, you and I know the answer to that. But can you see why people back then might have found this a little bit puzzling? Who would King David call the Lord except for God? He is the king of Israel. There's nobody on the earth who's Lord over him. And yet David writes, the Lord says to my Lord. So most people back then, I believe, were looking at this as some sort of forward-looking promise. After all, God did promise to David that God would raise up your offspring, God says to David, after you who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. So it makes sense that many people back then probably heard a psalm like this, and they're thinking, okay, this is pointing forward to that day when the promise is fulfilled. After all, this psalm is about sitting on a throne. At my right hand is like a seat of power and authority. You picture a throne. Uh, this psalm is also about when all of the enemies are done away with. And you remember how that promised to David that one day one of his sons would be the king that has an everlasting kingdom. No enemy can come along and take it away. It is everlasting. So people probably hear this psalm in those days and they think, this is about that son of David. Jesus knows this. And so Jesus presses them a little further. He challenges them to put together a piece of all of this that they haven't put together yet. And it has to do with that word, Lord. So you say David's writing about this future son of David who's going to have this everlasting kingdom. Okay. Why would David call his son Lord? Who can King David call Lord except for God? Fathers don't call their sons Lord. If anything, it would go the other direction. It's the one who comes before the other who's given this honor of being called Lord. So why would David call his son Lord, Jesus says, and they can't give him an answer. They, they don't know. And that word Lord is contained this mystery. What are they missing? They're missing something about who Jesus is. I think they're probably missing something like what John the Baptist sees. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? He said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. And there's a riddle all into itself. I mean, that would seem like nonsense unless you knew something about 
the eternal existence, the eternal nature of the person we call Jesus. Because John was born before Jesus. John burst onto the scene before Jesus ever did, but also not really. Because Jesus is the Word made flesh. And John, the Gospel writer, has just finished saying that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God from the very start. And all things that have existence in this universe they come from him. So in that light, he was before me, takes on a whole new meaning. John sees that. The very same principle applies with David, calling his son, my Lord. Jesus is a son of David. He comes after David by a thousand years. And yet before he was the son of David, the incredible mystery is that he was already the son of God. He fits the bill of the promise, this son who would come after David, and yet he is also eternal, divine, Son of God. And that's why David can rightly call Jesus my Lord. That's the, the eye opening truth that nobody saw coming until God went out and did the rest of this verse. So when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, this is God's defeat of the world's greatest and oldest enemies, sin and death, are defeated at the cross and at the resurrection. And Ephesians says that God, verse 22, has put all things under Christ's feet. Just like Psalm 110 said. God did this. He put his power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Seated him at his right hand is exactly what Psalm 110 said. In Jesus, God did these things. And that raising up of Jesus to heaven, that part, to seat him on the throne, this is really like the light bulb moment for Peter and the other New Testament writers because people like Peter, they saw that. And it's like, this is where the riddle is revealed to them and they get it. And so when Peter goes and he proclaims the gospel in Acts chapter 2, this is like really the heart of his message. He says the resurrection of this man, Jesus, his ascension into heaven is proof that he's Lord. We rightly call him Lord. This Jesus God raised up. We all witnessed it. We know it's true. And being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he's poured out this, this message, that you see and hear. They see the tongues of fire. They hear this gospel sermon. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And Peter is saying, that has to be Jesus. It has to be Jesus because we saw it with our own eyes. God lifted him up to heaven. It seated him at his right hand. We saw him resurrected. We know that there's no enemy that can defeat him. Death couldn't defeat him. Who can? Satan couldn't. Who will? It has to be Jesus. He's the one that David rightly calls Lord. And that means we ought to call him Lord too. Maybe that's really the point. The point of all of these times that the New Testament brings us back to this one verse. The point is to show us how amazingly awesome Jesus Christ is over everything else in the world. 
And if even David calls him Lord, we should too. When Hebrews quotes this verse, it's to say that Jesus is greater than the angels of heaven. To which of the angels has God ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? None of them. Because only to Jesus does God give this highest honor. And if Jesus is Lord over the angels, if he's Lord over all the enemies of the world, then shouldn't he be Lord over us too? He is Lord over us too. But you and I are challenged to live like it. We ought to hold fast to our confession of the hope we profess without wavering. Because, as Hebrews reminds us earlier in chapter 10, Jesus offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, and he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. We ought to lay aside every weight that brings us down and the sin that entangles us so much in this world. Lay those things aside and run this race with perseverance. Why? Because Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross and scorned its shame, and now he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we look to him who endured all of this so that we might not grow weary or lose heart. It really reminds me of that story in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is martyred. And he looks up to heaven and he sees Jesus. Where is Jesus? He's at the right hand. At the right hand of God. And this glimpse into the true order of the universe gives Stephen the strength to endure to the very end and even pray for his enemies in a way that's a lot like Christ. As he understood who his Lord is. He understood where his Lord is. On a throne where his enemies can only fall at his feet. So maybe it's no wonder that this verse, after all, is the one that gets quoted all the time in our New Testament. It reveals a profound mystery, the eternal nature and lordship of Jesus, while at the same time offering both a challenge to the way we live our lives and a comfort that cannot be taken from us. And maybe one of those is what you need today. Do you need to be challenged today to remember that Jesus is the Lord? And if he is greater than the angels and greater than David and greater than all who lived, then we ought to live as though he's the Lord of our life too, enthroned on the throne of our hearts and in our lives. That's the challenge you need today. Maybe what you need today is the comfort that comes from knowing where our Lord is. He is in a place where no, nothing that happens on this world can change his lordship. Nothing can topple him. Nothing can defeat him. He will be there to raise us up, just as God raised him up, should we remain faithful to him. Maybe you're in a time in your life right now where you need to remember the true order of things, that Jesus is above all. Maybe you need to remember Jesus at the right hand of the throne of God right now as we speak. For someone, maybe it's time to respond to the gospel. The rest of that story in Acts chapter 2 is that after Peter revealed the mystery of Psalm 110, 
they all heard him proclaim Jesus to be the Lord, just like Psalm 110. This Jesus is both Lord and Christ. And many that day followed suit. They called him the Lord. They called him the Christ. The fulfillment of this promise. They repented of their sins. They were baptized in his name. They shared in the hope of his resurrection. That he would destroy his enemies. Maybe you're in need of response to that tonight. Maybe it touches someone's life who's with us online tonight. Or someone in this room. However you might be called or challenged this evening. I invite you to respond to our Lord. While we stand and while we sing.